I'm Angela Nov. At 32, I became a freelance programmer when I got married. The house where I live with my husband Dan, which we married three years ago, was originally my dad's property. We boldly renovated it to include my new workspace when we got married. A gentle husband and a newly established workspace of my own. I had envisioned a life in our home that, while modest, was filled with warmth and smiles. But that was just an illusion. Dan, who had been kind until our marriage, completely changed afterward. Now, all I get from him is complaints and harsh words. I was trying to contact him during his business trip to pass on urgent news from his brother, Ethan, about the sudden death of his mother, Mary. But I couldn't reach him no matter how many times I called. I had just managed to get through to Dan on the phone. Hello. What are you thinking? I told you I was in an important meeting with a client. Stop calling me over and over. I'm sorry, but Mary is. What? Mom, don't you dare casually talk about my mom. A useless wife who's just a burden to me. Still, just listen, Mary is. Enough. I'm telling you it's a business meeting. Or are you going to take responsibility if this deal doesn't go through? Every time I try to speak, he drowned me out with his shouting, not letting me get a word in. Why is this happening? Tears slowly started to well up as I felt a tightness in my chest. Why are you crying? Lucky you, women just need to cry. You think I'll listen just because you cry. Idiot. Your tears mean nothing to me, just don't bother me. Tomorrow, and the day after, I have hospitality events. I'm turning off my phone until I get back. Don't call me over some trivial matter. Wait a minute. Ignoring my words, he mercilessly hung up. Radial only returned an impersonal mechanical tone. He must have turned off his phone. Trying to calm my racing heart, I took deep breaths. Dan was the one who refused. Desperate to get my point across. I have to go alone now. I'm going to your parents' house. Leaving that message unread on his cell phone, I hurried to Dan's parents' home. Dan and I met through his sister, Emily. I was still in touch with my high school friend, Emily, even after graduation. One day, while I was still working at a company, I ended up getting involved in a project at Emily's company, and we coincidentally reunited there. At that time, Emily was with Dan. Is that Angela? I heard a reserved voice calling from a distance. Wow, Emily? Wow, why is Angela here? Haven't seen you since the reunion two years ago. Right? It's been so long. How have you been? Good. Just getting by every day. Angela, this is my brother, Dan. Unfortunately, we ended up working at the same company. Looking past Emily, I saw a man smiling at our conversation. That was my first meeting with Dan. He was slightly older than us, with a calm demeanor. His stylish three-piece suit and sharp eyes were striking. Hey, Emily, you followed me into this company on your own, that's on you. Sorry, I'm Dan North. Emily always talks about how much she owes you. I'm Angela Brown. Emily and I have been friends since high school. I remember Emily mentioning you back in high school. She said there was this incredibly talented and nice girl from a good family she admired. You're exactly as I pictured from her description. Remembering the casual conversations Emily had about me, 
hearing his pleasant voice complimenting me, it all made my face flush with embarrassment in an instant. Dan, what are you doing hitting on a girl you just met? This is the office. No, really. I mean it. Well, thank you. I replied somewhat awkwardly, to which he responded with a gentle smile. By the way, Angela, do you have time? Oh, no, shoot, I have to go. Sorry about that. My brother can be a bit intrusive. That's not it. But sorry for taking your time. No, I should be the one apologizing. Well, see you around. I said, bowing slightly before hurrying toward the elevator. Angela. I heard his voice call from behind me. Yes. I turned back, and he asked kindly. Could we maybe talk more sometime? Could I get your contact from Emily? His kind voice naturally made me nod. After that, Dan and I began to communicate directly. At first, we went out to eat, then eventually, we took drives in his car, and after several dates, Dan confessed his feelings. His kindness, his dependable nature, and the way he listened made me feel truly supported. Our relationship smoothly progressed to marriage. Both families were overjoyed, especially Emily, who became my sister-in-law, and Mary, my mother-in-law, who wept with happiness. Consider me your real mother, and come to me with anything, I'm always on your side. Mary treated me like a real mother, even before we got married, and we had lunch together and went shopping. Even after getting married, she would occasionally visit our home to check on us and our married life. Our newlywed life began in the renovated house I mentioned earlier, once owned by my dad. I lived in this house when I was little, and it holds so many memories with my mom. I'm so happy to be able to transform it and live here with my new family. So, you lived here until you were 10, right? Yes, we moved to the main family house after my grandfather passed away so my dad could take over. I have memories in our current family home, too, but the memories from my childhood feel more special somehow. The roses in the garden were my mom's favorite, and I cherished eating the lunches she made for me under their full bloom. I hope to one day share similar scenes with my own children, reminiscent of those days with my mom. As we talked about having children from early in our marriage. But Dan's attitude began to cool not long after we wed. You're home all day, and dinner's still not ready. You're too inefficient. And the shirts, you better iron them every day. No slacking. What? This is all you made for dinner. This looks like animal feed. I'm not eating this. Order something from Uber Eats. You have it easy, working from home without the daily commute. You live in a sweet world where you can work and make money comfortably. These harsh words were even tossed at me in front of Mary, who was visiting our home. Of course, Mary was furious and always scolded Dan for his behavior. What are you talking about? Working from home isn't easy at all. Unlike office workers, freelancers have to secure their own work. You should know how hard that is. You're in sales yourself. Apologize. This kind of scenario was a daily occurrence. I'm sorry, Angela. Since our family was a single parent family, he has become arrogant. Dan's family was the opposite of mine. It was a single parent home run by his mom. My family became a single parent family after my mom passed away when I was in high school, whereas Dan's parents divorced when he was in middle school. 
Mary had been working alone to raise three children since then. Besides her full-time job, she also freelanced for a friend's company, deeply understanding the challenges of working as a woman and freelancing. No, compared to what Mary has been through, my troubles are nothing. Maybe he's just experiencing cold feet about our marriage. But that's no excuse. He's an adult. He needs to manage his own moods. Especially if you have children, it's going to get even harder for you. You need to teach him now. Mary always confronted Dan firmly when he did wrong. Yet, despite her efforts, Dan's coldness only accelerated, culminating in the moment I miscarried our child. Was it because I had been working? Should I have been more cautious? Did I eat something strange? Was it because I drank something cold? I blamed myself over and over, overwhelmed with sadness. I couldn't even muster the strength to sit up or eat. Naturally, I neglected our home. Dan had started traveling more for work even before the pregnancy, often leaving the house empty, which worried Mary. She stayed over to help and support me. Angela, it's okay to cry. There was a life inside you, no matter how small. It's natural for a mother to grieve when her child is lost. Mary, thank you. It's normal to feel physically drained. I'm here, so it's going to be okay. Let's slowly get your strength back. She said so and hugged me. As I wept uncontrollably in her arms, Dan, just back from his business trip, looked at me with cold eyes. Are you still crying? Your body wasn't fit for pregnancy. It's your own fault. It happened because you were too busy working freely. You were disqualified as a mother. Dan's cutting words tore through my heart, feeling like shards piercing through me. As my tears wouldn't stop and my body shivered uncontrollably, Mary held me even tighter. Dan, enough already. You got nothing to do with this. What joy do you find in hurting someone who's already hurt? What reason do you have to cause Angela such pain? You, he aren't even prepared to be a father, have no right to criticize Angela. You was a proper mother. Mary's voice, frighteningly low and unlike anything I had heard from her before, echoed in the quiet room. Realizing his fault, Dan clicked his tongue and stormed off to his room. Slam. The door slammed with an unnecessary force, making me feel as if my heart too had been shut down. Mary remained kind afterward. Although my relationship with Dan continued to deteriorate, Mary's presence supported me. I didn't know if Mary had told Emily about everything, and now that Emily had been transferred to a different branch, I didn't have the energy to go see her and talk. I didn't want to worry my dad, who had been overjoyed at his only daughter's wedding. It wasn't something I could casually discuss with others. I focused on my work, which Dan had criticized me for being too engrossed in. As a result, my work started to pick up again and I was slowly finding my way back to a happier state. That gave me a bit more perspective on Dan. Glancing at the calendar, I noticed his frequent business trips had become excessively frequent. It had started about a year ago and intensified over the past six months to the point where he was hardly home half the month. Hey, are you going on another business trip this week? Of course. Make sure my ironing and packing are done by tomorrow. Hasn't the travel been a bit much lately? You're still in the same department, right? That's none of your business. I'm dealing with some complicated cases, flying out to handle things. Stop nagging me at home. 
It's annoying. With that, Dan unilaterally ended the conversation and staggered off to the bedroom. Left on the table were his half-finished whiskey. Alongside the smartphone he'd forgotten, he probably passed out in bed by now, having drunk a bit too much. I resisted the urge to bring him his forgotten items, feeling spiteful. Then his phone lit up with an incoming call. It seems a message has arrived. A text message from a clearly female name popped up. Looking forward to the resort hotel this week. Thanks for booking a nice hotel. Loved being all cozy at home last week, let's get cozy again after Tim sleeps, good night. The message included a picture likely taken by her. So that's how it is. I muttered to myself, realizing the gravity of the situation. Dan's phone was secured with fingerprint authentication. Dan was deep in sleep, thanks to the alcohol. Without hesitation, I used his finger to unlock his smartphone quickly. When I hurried to Dan's parents' house, Ethan and Emily were deep in conversation. Sorry, I'm late. Angela. Emily sparted me and burst into tears, hugging me tightly. She sobbed softly, and I gently stroked her back to comfort her. Can I see Mary? I asked, and Emily, holding my hand, led me to Mary. There, Mary lay peacefully as if asleep. I sat beside her pillow, joined my hands, and gently touched her face. Her skin was cold. Her eyes remained closed. The reality of Mary's death hit me, and tears began to overflow. How long I cried, I don't know. I bit my lip to hold back new tears and slowly lifted my head. Then Ethan softly asked me, Angela, where's Dan? Well, um, he said he had an important business trip. A business trip? My response seemed to startle Emily. It must have been evident she had been crying. She said clearly, despite her tearful, nasal voice. His department doesn't really do business trips, you know? I was shocked by her statement, and my tears instantly retracted. Really? There hasn't been a change in policy or anything? Nope. But Dan has been on business trips almost all the time for the past six months, barely home. That's impossible. You know, Angela, since you two were dating, Dan hardly ever had business trips, right? I know, but... Hey, is something going on? Emily's keen sense must have picked up on my distress. Talk to me. She held my hand, urging me to share. Despite hesitating because of the sensitive nature of the topic, I couldn't bear it alone any longer. Ethan and Emily, there's something I need you both to see. I said, pulling out my smartphone and displaying the dot I had captured from Dan's phone yesterday. The shock on their faces quickly turned into grim expressions as they intensely scrolled through the screen. This can't be. Seriously. Their whispers were tinged with disappointment. After a brief discussion, we divided tasks to attend to Mary's final matters. Contacting relatives and acquaintances. Meeting with the funeral home. Managing finances and other arrangements. I had asked the funeral home to have the eldest son as the chief mourner, thinking Dan would come. No one's heard from him. He's not coming anymore. I agree. He told me not to contact him because he has entertainment tomorrow and the day after, and he's turning off his phone. I don't think we can reach him anymore. Seriously, such a bastard.
Watt Business Entertainment, it's just a cover for his affair trip. It must have been against Ethan and Emily's wishes to have such sibling disputes during their beloved mother's final moments. Ethan, frustrated, promptly changed the chief mourner to himself. Then the farewell ceremony took place. Mary, whose single parent raised three children, was deeply respected, and many people came to bid her farewell. Mary loved everyone and was loved by everyone. How strangers must have viewed the situation, with the second son as the chief mourner and only the eldest son's wife present. While expressing many thanks to Mary ascending to heaven, this fact remained a lump in my heart. After everything was over, we returned to the family home. Her portrait was placed in the living room. After finally catching a breath, the three of us were having a simple dinner, discussing future plans, when there was a clattering at the entrance, followed by the door bursting open with a bang. Angela, you're here right. Answer me. Dan's loud voice echoed as he stomped closer. He flung open the living room door, appearing like a demon. What the hell are you doing going to my family home on a weekday? Are you kidding me? Where's my dinner? Don't be slacking off at someone else's house. Dan, red-faced with anger, seemed oblivious to Ethan and Emily's presence as he unleashed his fury at me. Then Ethan slammed the table hard and strode towards Dan. In an instant, he swung his fist, striking Dan's face. Ouch! As he groaned, Ethan grabbed the back of Dan's neck and leaned in, shouting, Don't mess with me. You have no right to yell at Angela. Where the hell have you been traveling? What's so important about this trip that you can't even make contact, damn it? Ethan's face was so close it seemed like it could touch Dan's as he yelled and spit flew. He tightened his grip on the collar even more, twisting Dan's face as his pained breathing grew louder. So, where have you been traveling? Since when does your department have so much travel? What kind of business entertainment requires days of commitment in the countryside? A cold, mechanical Emily asked, and Dan frantically tried to respond. But with his breathing shallow from being choked, he could only muster a muffled groan. At that, Ethan sighed and with the same hand, he forcefully threw Dan onto the floor. Uck. Dan gasped in pain as he was slammed onto the floor. Ethan looked down at him coldly and pressed further. What have you been doing up until now? It's not a business trip. It's not entertainment. So, where have you been the last three days after leaving home? What's keeping you so busy you can't even answer your phone? Start explaining now. It's a commitment I had to attend, even if it meant taking leave. You guys just don't know. Leave? You haven't taken any leave. Aren't you just regularly going to the office? What? Dan hadn't expected Emily to challenge him about the leave. Embarrassed, he let out a pathetic sound. Why would you even? It's not hard to find out. We work at the same company. I just asked a friend in your department. What the hell? What are you doing messing around? What if people start looking at me weirdly? He's truly a man of extreme emotional swings. Too intense to realize he can't see things clearly. Emily seems exasperated too. What do you mean strange looks? We've tried to contact you over and over, but there's never any call back. All we hear is that you're on a business trip, but we don't even know where you are or what you're doing. It's only natural to check with your office. I've told her I'm on a business trip. I said I couldn't take calls. Isn't that enough? 
That's just not normal, no matter the excuse. Not being able to communicate for days, whether on a business trip or entertaining, that just doesn't happen. That's why we checked with your company, right? Faced with Emily's calm and logical points, Dan struggles to find a good response. Geez, why do you have to call me repeatedly? It's annoying. Yet, Dan tries to bluster his way through, which only makes Ethan clench his fists tighter. Hey, don't you see anything, Ron? And what about mom? Hey, mom, I'm thirsty, get me a drink. These people don't notice anything. What kind of upbringing is that? I have no words to say to him. Blaming others for his own faults. What is this man talking about? That comment made something inside me snap. And what kind of upbringing did you have? What? I'm asking you. What kind of upbringing did you have? Bang. Slamming my fists on the table in front of him, I shouted at the top of my lungs, how did I look at him? I kept bombarding Dan with words as he stared in shock. What is your business trip? To embrace your mistress? Or to go for a walk with your illegitimate newborn baby in your arms? To play family and go to a resort hotel? To leave your legal family alone and lavish your earnings on your mistress? You mean the miscarried wife is disqualified and the mistress who had the baby is worth the money? Is a legally bound wife just a slave to be abused and mistreated? This is ridiculous. Don't mess with me because of all the stress you've caused. Mary is. As I stood up, I found myself shouting again. The words I had just uttered blurred my vision. But I was determined not to cry. I bit my lip hard, eyes wide open, trying to hold it together. Emily came over to comfort me, gently stroking my back. I bit my lip harder, recalling Mary in my gestures. Mom won't make tea for you. If you want some, make it yourself. What? Why should I listen to such nonsense from my younger sister? Are you really that clueless? Can't you see what's going on? Our mom is dead. Emily's words, filled with anger, stunned Dan. Suddenly, Dan started laughing. What are you all playing at? Telling me mom's dead to annoy me. You must be lying because mom's not home, right? Ridiculous. At his scoffing laugh, Ethan's slap landed with a smack. Ouch. Dan, holding his cheek in pain, endured the sudden blow while Ethan spoke in a cold tone. Go check the other room. Why? I said go to that room. With such a cold voice, Dan reluctantly headed to the other room. Oh, no. His breathless voice came from the room. He saw Mary's portrait. He seemed unable to process what he was seeing. Wait, why didn't anyone tell me? When? When did this happen? Dan's outburst made me wonder what was going through his mind. While I was lost in thought, Emily methodically explained. Mom passed away two days ago. She collapsed suddenly early in the morning, and she was gone by the time the ambulance got her to the hospital. It was a heart attack. It all happened so fast. There wasn't even time to call anyone. I tried to reach you right after, Dan, but couldn't get through, so I called Angela. Angela tried multiple times too, but couldn't reach you. When she finally did, you said you were busy on a business trip and about to turn off your phone. You remember saying that, right? Dan, feeling cornered by Emily's calm, logical explanation, stumbled over his words. Work is work, can't help it. But Emily, growing more irritated, resumed her accusation. Still talking about work. You heard what Angela said earlier, right? 
we know everything. That you're having an affair, you have a secret child, and you've been living with that other family under the guise of business trips. What are you talking about? Nothing you say matters anymore. Stop making excuses. Excuses? Proof. How do you know if what she's saying is even true? Faced with Dan's continued defiance, I silently operated my smartphone and thrust the screen towards him. Gosh. He muttered, stunned as I began playing the video. The video showed the conversation I had seen on Nen's phone with his mistress that day. Why are you? I took it from your phone left in the living room. There was a message from a woman that popped up with her name. Seeing that message, I realized you've been cheating and even has a kid. Oh my God. There were plenty of pictures left too, showing the woman and the child. Really generous of you. Cheating is one thing, but having a child is quite another, isn't it? That is. So I used your fingerprint unlock on your phone. And things keep popping up. I thought you'd be more careful. Messages and pictures just left as they were. Doesn't seem like something a man secretly playing family elsewhere would do, right? Once I got past the fingerprint lock, it was all laughs with the evidence filing up. Don't you think you should have managed this crisis a bit better? You wouldn't think it'd be seen. People who do such things usually act more cautiously. Were you too caught up to think straight, or are you just simple? Either way, you had no crisis management skills. Well, thanks to that, I got all the evidence I needed, so everything worked out. With Dan taken aback by my rebuke, Ethan added fuel to the fire. And just so you know, we've seen it all too. Emily brought back testimony from the company, and we've got it all sorted and documented. What? We've heard all about how you've treated Angela, really the worst. What you've been doing is outright domestic violence. Mom was really troubled by it. Did I go wrong in raising him? I feel so sorry for Angela. Mary. And on top of that, as the eldest son, you couldn't even be there for Mom's last moments. We had to switch the chief mourner from you to Ethan, the second son. Everyone wonders why the eldest son isn't there, but his wife is. It's shameful, really shameful. Apologize to Mom. Emily's anguished cry echoed powerfully. I'm sorry. Dan whispered softly, his thoughts some mystery. Even his summer expression seems nothing but a lie now. Mom left a will saying your part should go to Angela as compensation for the trouble you caused. Really? Mom left a will even though she was a single parent compensation that's how much she regretted and worried about you a grown man and on top of that you even had an affair don't ever come back here again you're no brother of ours the portrait of mary on the table always showed her smiling like a flower two months had passed since then life had returned to normal the only difference now was that I was living alone in this house. I was enjoying my newfound solitude. During that time, right in front of Ethan, Emily, and Mary, I presented the divorce papers to Dan. There was no way he could refuse under those circumstances. Reluctantly, he signed them, and the divorce was finalized. I told Dad everything after it was all over. If Angela can be happy, then I'm satisfied with that. With accepting words, I also received comforting ones. You should rely more on me. As for Dan, he seems to have quit his job. The reason was a conflict with his supervisor due to compliance violations. 
When I uploaded the images of the other woman to my phone, Emily remarked, She might be someone from our company. Emily got the woman's home address while she was on maternity leave by asking a friend at the company and confronted her. Showing her the video, she said, My brother's wife is my friend. Be prepared to take full responsibility. Naturally, the woman was speechless. She had only been with the company a few years and didn't know Dan's sister worked at another branch. Realizing the seriousness, she hastily quit the company. But the story didn't end there. Rumors swirled in the company about a single woman who abruptly left on maternity leave. Furthermore, Emily's investigation into Dan and the woman probably triggered it all. All the secrets came to light, causing a compliance issue in the company, and Dan was offered a transfer to a remote island. Unable to accept this, he snapped at his boss and decided to resign. I don't know if the two are still together or have separated. I don't want to know, and I don't try to. Emily and Ethan feel the same. By the way, did you get the alimony from Dan and that woman? Emily is visiting me today. Probably out of concern to see how I'm doing. I was genuinely happy that she cared like Mary did. Yeah, the lawyer Ethan introduced was really capable. It's all thanks to Ethan. That's great. I've entrusted this matter to a lawyer recommended by Ethan. This lawyer, a colleague of Ethan's, is highly skilled and has successfully secured the desired compensation from Dan and his mistress without any issues. We really... Emily hesitantly started speaking. I truly feel sorry for what happened to Angela. What? Especially me. If I hadn't introduced you to Dan, you wouldn't have had to end your such a life. I think about that and it's too late, but I'm really sorry. Emily apologized to me. Hey, what are you saying? I don't think that way at all. But. There's no but. Sure, it's been tough. I've been hurt more times than I can count. But you know what? I'm really glad I met Mary. The time I spent with her felt like I was with a real mother. Those memories are like treasures to me. So, thank you, Emily, for that. Tears welled up in Emily's eyes as she smiled faintly at my words. Emily and Ethan had said they'd cut ties with Dan after that incident. Although I am now divorced from Dan and thus effectively a stranger to him, Emily and Ethan cannot sever their ties as easily. Blood connections cannot be undone so simply. Even if they never meet again, some bonds will remain unbroken. Yet, I hope they never have to worry about Dan again and can live happily ever after. That's probably what Mary would wish for too. Emily, it's about time you find your happiness, right? Are you saying that now, Angela? Yes, now, because I truly want you to be happy, both as a friend and as family. Emily's eyes widened as she looked at me, her eyes shimmering, Indeed, I divorced Dan, who is Emily's brother. Now that we no longer have a familial relationship, Emily and I are just friends. But having been family once and having gone through such turmoil together, I can no longer think of Emily as just another person. And if there ever comes a time when I can be the one to support Emily, who helped me so much back then, I even find myself hoping for that. Mom would be happy about this. Yeah, I really loved Mary. I know. So both of you need to be happy. I'm sure Mom is watching over us all the time. Outside the large window, the rose that Mom loved is in full bloom. The clear blue sky, perhaps reaching as far as where Mary is now, 
makes me think, if only I could be like her one day. That was what I thought back then, and years later, in another story, I finally became a real mother.